The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. The end of the matter is that the earth is going to be burnt out, burning up. It will be totally rent asunder, torn to pieces. So the end result of the earth is to be burned up in a fervent heat. And that means everything is burning. And if you look right now, what's happening in the world? The conditions of the world are becoming very conducive of fires all over the place. Right now, we're progressing towards that end event. What else do we know? The government right now, in the last two years, has been preparing for Earth to wobble out of its orbit. So that means you're going to see a time. I've heard guys talk very seriously about the conditions here on this earth and what the populace will do. When you see people who are in very high stress positions cry because there's no solution to what's happening when they actually have to face reality, if they actually live in the time frame where it's going to take place. And we're talking about some hardened men and women of the uniformed services. When you see defeat in their faces, because there is no mitigation to what's coming, you might want to take some things seriously. And it's very unfortunate that will only take place in closed circles. But when you see that, it means that uh, these guys don't have an answer. They don't have any mitigation plans for what's coming. But what I'm talking about is a change in the earth that will be so violent that um, not one thing is going to be spared. Everything is going to be toppled shaken really challenged to its core because you're talking about the entire planet altering its position now we all know that air and water is dynamic it's not static it's very dynamic so if the earth ships as it moves and settles water is going to tend to keep its position and then after the earth finishes any type movement the water is going to continue to move in the direction it was moving until it's another force is imposed upon it well, for example, if the Earth did a, they, they call it a stutter. And what a stutter is, is if the Earth suddenly shifts about 28 degrees, then the Earth will move. The soil is, every, the, the hardened parts of the Earth is going to move, but the water in the air is still going to be in its same position until forces begin to act upon the water and the air and it finally catches up to the momentum or the inertia that was imposed upon the earth and so what you're looking at is air moving at 200 plus miles an hour water moving at, at a very fast rate across all the lands there will be no structures left there will be nothing left you know in the bible it says there was a great earthquake that's what it says and every mountain and island removed out of its place you know what i believe i believe that that great earthquake because in the original text it says earth shaking there'll be a great earth shaking and every mountain and island is going to be moved out of its place i believe that's when this event actually takes place see a lot of people are looking for a fault line to crack that great earthquake but that's not what the original text is it's earth shaking so some sort of event that affects the entire earth and that would be that event water and air would have to catch up with an increase you're going to have an example of a stutter in less than six months we'll have an example of a stutter and i can almost guarantee you that cities are going to start toppling in fact i know that nobody not one person is going to remain in certain cities in the usa not one person these are the times that are coming, and they're quite serious. And there's no way I can convey the seriousness of what's actually going to take place. There's no way. There's nobody with a heart would ever communicate something like that. I don't, I don't believe they could actually do that. I don't believe they could. But uh, people are in for a rough ride. And I guess that's why my emphasis on salvation and not toying around with your salvation is so important in these days. To not lose yourselves in the rhetoric of this world, politics, and other things, right? Because these times are not going to skip anybody. And when you read the sober parts of the Word of God, when God says, He'll have no mercy upon the, the children, the fathers, and the mothers, and everybody else, that means everybody will go through it. But the Lord will be the help of His own people. The Lord is going to be the help of those who believe in Him. He'll be that help, right? But we gotta, we got to be sober enough. To really start thinking about prophecy as something that we're going to have to live through, that we're going to live in, at least the beginning half of prophecy. Somebody says, can a person be possessed by demons without knowing it? Listen, if you don't have a born-again spirit, then you have something with you already. How about that? Now, that's from the Bible. We're not talking about theory. We're talking about God's Word. That's right there in the Bible. 
if you don't have a born again spirit, something is with you already. It's already with you. It's been with your family. So in other words, if you're not washed by the blood of the lamb, you have spirits with you already. So the only way to have a cleansed spirit is to have a born again spirit. If you do not have a born again spirit, you have something with you already. And that explains why people have such tendencies in certain areas when they don't have a born again spirit. It explains how a person can, you know, they can be a loving person one moment and outrageous the next without a born again spirit. With a born again spirit, you don't have those moments. You're not, you know, flip flopping back and forth. You're not doing that. When you don't have a born again spirit, there's something already with you. It's been with you from the beginning. So without that, and a born again spirit is not something you have a ceremony for. Born again spirit is something that the Lord gives you when you're serious about him. And he does so in his timing. He does not do so in our timing. He does so in his timing, in a truthful timing. And it's not based on what you think you're doing. It's based on the truth of you. The truth of your acceptance of all things of Christ. So that's based in absolute truth. People struggle when they don't have a born-again spirit. People find themselves unable to commit totally to the living God without a born-again spirit. People find themselves with anger issues and emotional problems. What you're seeing right now, for the most part, are a few things. You're seeing things that have been underneath your feet come topside. Number one, these sinkholes that people are starting to access are exposing underground territories. Number two, but everything is about to shake loose. Number three, the true nature of the spiritual realm is about to be experienced. Number four, the manifestation of what's been watching you but never was given authority to come near you. They're going to start coming forward. They're only after those who operate by darkness. Do you guys hear me? If you operate by any darkness, there are things that that darkness has come from and they're coming to get their property back. And if it happens to be within you, they're coming to get you. And they have a right to get you because you've been living by their power, not by your father's power. Hope you understand that. If you operate by anger, you operate by greed, you're emotionally driven and you're in a chaotic mode all the time, there are things coming to get you. You're operating by what they are providing. The Lord told us not to operate by any of those things, not to walk in the flesh, which means don't live your life by desires. Don't live your life by a, a whim, gut intuitions and things of that nature. Don't do that. Someone said when you speak to us about New Zealand volcanoes, well, New Zealand is irrelevant concerning the big volcanoes. How's that? I know it doesn't match what everybody else talks about, right? People talk about what they know about. To be honest with you, when every when when, when I first came online in COT, uh, talking to everybody about these things, everybody talked about Yellowstone. In fact, every week Yellowstone was about to erupt, and that was back in, in 1999. And then in 2012, people started talking about Yellowstone, and it was going to erupt every two months. Every time there is some sort of an earthquake, Yellowstone is about to erupt. Yellowstone has done absolutely zip, and every other volcano has erupted and cost lives. Isn't that funny? Yellowstone hasn't done anything. And while everybody's waiting on Yellowstone to blow, these other volcanoes have cost people their lives. I'm saying that to give you a pattern of how things operate. Sometimes we can get stuck on one thing for so long, we disregard everything else. When you look at volcanoes and what they have an ability to do, look at all of them. Look at the big picture. Like an artist, when an artist draws a picture, they're taught never to get stuck on any small detail, but continue to draw the entire picture. Never get stuck on a small detail over here or over there. It will mess up the entire composition. In that same context, when you're watching in times events, never get stuck in one small area, but watch everything. Watch everything your father mentioned. Never allow your attention to be drawn into one area because you'll miss everything else. That's why we have such surprises in our lives. Somebody says, what you're understanding in Revelation 7 9 about Satan being loosed after Christ's reign of a thousand years. That's God's grace and mercy. Can't you see that? That is so beautiful to me. But that's the fulfillment of the remaining portions of prophecy. And that is God's absolute love. A lot of people right now, right now, a lot of people right now, they would say, well, you know, I couldn't believe because I, I didn't really see. And they might be serious. So watch what the Lord does. He has Satan bound a thousand years. Christ is ruling and reigning on earth with those who are loyal to him. Before they saw anything, those who are faithful to him will rule and reign with him during that time. A thousand years. Human beings are alive. 
Those who walk with Christ prior to his arrival are in a glorified form here on this earth with Christ, teaching mankind and everything else. So new generations are going to be born on the earth in a time where they can actually see the Christ. Now listen, so they're not going to be like you. We walk by faith. So we're, we accumulate and we do everything by very authentic core reason, which is our faith put inside of us. But you're going to have a group of people who will see what we never saw, who are going to walk in times and miracles and marvelous things will happen on the earth. They're going to see entities nobody else saw. And then all of a sudden, after that thousand years is expired, Satan will be loosed. And what does it say? He goes out and deceives the people of the earth again on the four quarters of the earth again. So what happened there? And then what do they ultimately do? They go to war with the living God. And God wipes them all out and judgment starts right there in that day. So what actually happened? I truly, honestly believe that you have souls out there that will have an excuse. Well, you know, I couldn't quite believe it. I couldn't just take it on somebody's word. But if I saw it and experienced it, you know, I could then I could deal with that. So the Lord gives a time where they see it. They live in it. They experience it. Right? They partake of it. And when Satan is loosed, they still agree with his darkness. What is he demonstrating? That when a person is born of darkness, they will never come to the light. When God judges, no one will have an excuse because all avenues will have been exhausted. See, at your core, you are a spirit. Because you're in a body and you walk around, you're a living soul. So you have an individual nature to you. You also have freedom. You have, we have the mechanism of faith. But what about those living spirits who need to see something? They're going to see everything, and they will still be a part of the darkness. I even think that they will not perceive the chance they're being given. They won't. And it's true what the Lord says are two origins of people, those of his spirit and those of darkness. There's only two origins, those of his spirit and those of darkness. It is said in the Bible that no seed of God will remain in the world. And that means they, they will not remain as being part of this world, doing things of the world, but they will return back to the Father again. And no seed of darkness is going to remain among the righteous. They will always betray the righteous. That is the story of the wheat and the tear. In the beginning, when the wheat was sown, they perceived an adversary called the devil who was sowing tares among the wheat. And they asked the master, should we go and tear out, you know, uproot? All the seeds the enemy sown, and the master said no, because if you take them out early, you could damage the wheat. Do you know what that is? Before you know who is who, before God shows you who is who, if a tear was uprooted or taken away right before your eyes, you would say, oh, that's no fair. That Henry was such a good person. He was such a good, loving person. Why did God do that to him? That's what you would say. And so the master said, no, let them grow. Let them come to their full size. Then when they're full grown, harvest the tares. Why? Because when they're full grown, they produce what? Fruit. Also, when tares are full grown, what do they do? They start choking out the wheat. Only when they're full grown. Do they, can you actually see the difference between the wheat and the tares? So guess what? When he uproots the unrighteous from the earth, when they're full grown, they will have already gotten to you. You know how when people get to you and nobody does anything about it and they continue to exist? They did not escape. It's important that you see who is who. But you have to live your experience to see. And then ultimately, God will have revealed to you who is who. You will know it. At the end, he said he would gather up all the tares first. Not the wheat, but the tares first. He would gather them up first. How is he doing this? the system of the beast, the systems of this world. The world is the first mechanism that separates the wheat and the tares. Those who are of the tares are good in the system of the tares, which is the world, their systems. Many of you who love the Lord, you're no good in their systems because you have a conscience. To be good in these systems, your conscience must be seared for the hot iron. You have to be willing to kill, to murder, to maim, to have knowledge of people starving, and to say Jimmy Crack Corn. In order to be successful in this world, you must become cold-hearted, or you won't, you just won't survive long. So all of them are being gathered into something called the world. So what's happening to the wheat? The wheat is surviving in the world, but they would rather be somewhere else. They thought their joy could be in the world, 
but then they were quickly upset and they were looking for a new home. So that, that's the beginning of the separation. The fullness of the separation is the kingdom of the beast. When the beast system gets here and the world can do exactly what they've been wanting to do without restraint, that'll be the height of the system of the beast. Then that means they will overcome the saints of the Most High, pushing them out of the system. To, to overcome the saints of the Most High is simply to have the will of darkness work over the will of the righteous. That's all. So the world's going to get its way, and most of the righteous, all of the righteous are going to sit in a type of defeat if they're not careful. They're going to say, I don't understand how wicked prospers. Aren't people saying that now? Oh, look at how the wicked prosper. And the Lord is saying, what comfort your hearts? They haven't gotten away with anything. And when the Lord comes back, he'll do what? With the coming, with his brightness. It, it says he'll destroy darkness with the coming of his brightness in a lot of different descriptions like that. Those who remain faithful to him will be called to him because they're already in his barn, which is why the world can do anything with it. All those in darkness will hate the Lord and his coming. They'll also be scared of him. Why? Because the contrast will be so great then. It'll be so great between light and darkness. All the tears are going to be gathered up and burned. Now, isn't it funny how he said all the tares are going to be gathered up and burned, and that in the Bible it keeps telling you that the earth is going to burn. So, what, are, what can we learn from all of that? We can take away that we don't know who the tares are, and the tares don't know who the wheat are until they are fully grown. When they're fully grown, the tares get exactly what they want, which is called the world and its systems operating the way they want them to operate. So they have their utopias in earth, but our home, we believe by faith and do long for. The Lord comes back and becomes a fulfillment of the wheat, but the tares are gathered together and burned. So what do you do right now? You already know you don't know the difference between the wheat and the tear. So how are you to conduct your lives? You are to love your enemy. You are to love those who despitefully use you and persecute you. You are to forgive those who will not forgive you. You are to afford an opportunity of righteousness to all. You are to stay within the bounds of your family. And your family is of the living God and of righteousness. It is not of iniquity. And in your process called life, you are breaking away from iniquity. How so? Because God places you in a situation where you're able to choose iniquity or righteousness. Normally you face the iniquity first and you find out, oh, I want nothing to do with that. And you seek to go home. In which case you start choosing righteousness through faith. The fulfillment of your faith comes when Jesus Christ comes back. That's why you should never worry about somebody getting away with anything. That's why you should never envy the prosperity of the world. They're grouping themselves together. That's how God gets all the tares together. They're drawn together in these big mobs called government and everything else. And they run the entirety of the earth, but only for a season. Every single system in this world is going to come crashing down. Every single idol is going to be destroyed off the face of the earth. Everything will crumble except whatever was found righteous and worthy in the earth. And the only thing according to the living God that's found righteous and worthy is you, those of you who still yet trusted in the Messiah specifically. Those of you who stayed the course, those of you who fought the good fight of faith. For everybody else, every temptation, every deceitful thing, every dream, every nightmare is going to be found right here on the face of the earth. When darkness is denied its reign, it will consume everybody who ever belonged to it. That day is coming. And I can tell you right now, you don't belong on that side. You belong on the side of light because in your heart of hearts, you cry out for righteousness. Now, you may not be righteous yourselves all the time, but God has not given anybody the understanding of what your soul actually cries out for. But if you're like other righteous folks, you share the same cry. You cry out for the righteousness of the Most High. When we communicate to each other, we communicate based on the level of things we know. And we know we don't know everything. And some of the things that we do know is all crooked and messed up. But in our heart of hearts, we're crying out for the living God, for his salvation. A tear does not do that. A tear will use the word of God to justify his or her decisions. And that's what you can watch for. There are ways you can discern who tears are. Listen to me carefully. If you can remember this one thing, you'll be armed very well. But you're never to judge a tear. 
Don't ever judge or tear by way of your heart, your mind, or anything else. Leave that to the living God. Now let me tell you how. A tear which is found among you. Many of them, not the obvious ones, but many of them are among you. So how do you know you're in your within your brothers and sisters in Christ? How do you know who is almost certainly a tear? A tear utilizes the word of God to support their decisions that they never repent of. Do you hear me? A tear is only interested in proving themselves right. A righteous person is connected to humility and meekness. They're never disconnected from that. Moses repented for his wrongdoings when he was not wrong. Jeremiah did the same. Isaiah did the same. Ezekiel did the same. All the, all the prophets did the same. Even David did it. King Solomon did it. All of them did it. But a tear will not do that. A tear will utilize the word of God to justify their position. A tear will always persecute someone and justify their persecution by scripture. A tear perverts the use of scripture to support his or her own prosecution of somebody else. Righteous people do not prosecute other people. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. God's people will judge in their time. But for now, they seek to obey Christ who said, Judge not that ye be not judged. Simple as that. A tear will go back to the Old Testament. So, oh no, God wants you to judge. That's what a tear is. A tear will always justify their position. They live in a perpetual chaos. Something is always wrong with somebody's doctrine. Jesus never talked about anybody's doctrine, did he? He never did that. He encouraged the righteousness in a person. He didn't go around pointing fingers. Jesus healed and delivered. The disciples did the same thing. They encouraged the gospel unto others who could hear. See, it's very, a tear, a wheat, wheat and the tear are very different. And as a person continues to live, should they be wheat and not a tear, humility and meekness become their primary attributes. They become that because you can't separate that from those who are in the family of the living God. I want you to think about something. If God sent his only begotten son for a bunch of sinners in the earth that wouldn't even acknowledge his name, what is that if that's not humility? God has been right this whole time, but never once did he rub that in our faces, did he? In all the moments we have been wrong, in all the moments we have corrected ourselves over the years, thinking we had scripture right one year, only two years later say, I had that totally wrong, Lord, I didn't know. But he didn't, he didn't cast us out for that, did he? We even spread that bad knowledge to other people, thinking that we were right in our prideful, egotistical minds. Why didn't the Lord get rid of us then? Because he loves us, and his love is genuine. That's why. And he has no pride in him, nor does he operate by pride. A prideful person would gloat over somebody who's wrong, and they would say, I'm right. When you say, even any of you, when you look at a person, you say, I'm right, and you're wrong, that's prideful. Life is not about being right and wrong. That's not what life is. Life is an opportunity. As you get older, you learn to encourage the good of a person, no matter how bad they are. That makes a difference. Telling a person that you're right and they're wrong only causes an argument. When you get older, that's exactly what you realize. But you can take a person who is stuck in their pride and encourage the small righteous thing they did, and they will tend to choose righteousness over pride. In so doing, you help that person heal and break free of their own mindset. That's how Christ worked. And he is our standard, Christ is, if we would only do the same. Consequently, you live in the days where people are going to lose themselves left and right. Be careful in these times. Be cautious in these times. Be cautious and careful to follow Christ. Do everything not to walk in the earth like you're right, because pious people do that. It's kind of like this political situation that you see with some of the rich people. Let me, let me clue you in on something. Rich people do not stay rich because they're good people. And there is a feud right now among the richest people on earth. That's what you're saying. There are going to be so many people upset by the sheer vileness that will come out of certain individuals. They're going to regurgitate their own mouths because they trust it in something that the Lord has already given us to know. How can a person who loves the Lord go a day without proclaiming Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords? How does that happen? We know who we used to be in our days when we were devious. We did not proclaim Christ every day. We were plotting and planning on how to control tomorrow. We know who we were in our sinful days. Don't we? Yet you have people looking to them. And should any of those belong to the Lord and people are looking to them for their salvation, 
God must do what he said he would do. That person has to fail the people. Why? Because the people continue to look to that person. When you look to a person and not the living God, then guess what happens? God will have that person fail right before your eyes. He wrote that. Jesus had that given to us in the Bible. And he says he does that for what reason? That man will not be glorified above the living God. That's why. That's exactly why Paul said, they don't want me to come to other countries and I got a bad reputation in some of these places. That's why Paul had a thorn in his side that the Lord would not remove. He said three times he asked that that thorn be removed. Three times. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee. The Lord did not remove it. But why? And what was that thorn? That thorn was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. And what was that messenger of Satan? Remember when Paul would go to various places and he would preach the gospel and somebody else would stand up and preach the anti-gospel? You remember that? That was the messenger of Satan to buffet him. Remember the people who would start rumors about Paul to, in the people's ears so that people would turn away from Paul? That was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. Paul was assigned an individual or individuals who would speak against what he was saying. And Christ would not remove it. Why? So that he would not be exalted above the Most High. See, if, if God would allow a person to be perfect in the eyes of everybody else, people would begin to worship the person and not the living God. So that messenger of Satan to buffet him was put in place by the living God. And God did that so that man will never be praised above the Lord our God. So anybody who carries the gospel of Jesus Christ to other people, who's going to be in the limelight in view of other people, if they belong to Christ, they're going to have a messenger of Satan to buffet them. Things are going to go wrong. Things are going to blow up. Things are going to happen to keep that person as a person in the eyes of everybody else. So don't worry about that stuff. Because it's not about our reputations. It's about the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Hopefully everybody has that, right? We do live in a time where everybody's trying to save their reputation. I happen to believe everything Yahshua said. I do not believe in theories. I don't live my life by theories. I think that's part of the problem in this world is too many people have theorized about scripture. And now you have a big group of people living their life by a theorized gospel. And by the way, that's a hybrid gospel. That's not a real gospel. That's not good news. The gospel is good news. You have a lot of people who say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian, but they don't believe in forgiveness. How, how can that be so? Isn't that the core? Isn't that the heart of the gospel? That you can be forgiven of those sins and infractions that you have committed over the course of your life? That you're free from that through the act of repentance? That's good news. But then you have people who say they believe in Christ. But they don't believe in forgiving anybody. They're walking around angry, upset, pointing fingers. In the Bible it says that God appoints kings. When God appoints a king, he appoints a king. But then American Christians, you know what they have an error of doing? If a Christian is a Democrat and a Democrat gets in the presidency, they'll say, yes, God appoints kings. But all of a sudden when the opposite person is selected, they'll say, well, that's the Antichrist. What is wrong with us? We believe in the word of God when we are the benefactors of it. But when we're not the benefactors of it, we don't believe in the word of God. That's ridiculous. Why do we continue to refuse to see that? If God appoints kings, Biden's in the White House for a reason. If God appoints kings, Trump was in the White House for a reason. If God appoints kings, Clinton was in the White House for a reason. These guys were in the White House for a reason. And if you believe in God's word, you start to see the reason. You don't see a mistake. That's not what you see. You see progression. You see what the Lord's doing. That's what you see. And when you see what the Lord's doing, it's very easy to say, hey, you might want to watch this because we're about to, such and such is about to happen. And you don't want to, you know, go in that direction. When it comes to judges and law enforcement and things like that, what is wrong with us Christians? Don't we remember what the Lord said? That because of us in the lands, he would always be a part of the judges and law enforcement for our sakes. Have you noticed that when people call out and they say, well, the cops are dirty and doing this, they're only dirty against those who have not quite committed unto the Most High. Why won't we just commit to the Most High and stop acting like we're saved and seek salvation? Listen, even as of late, and you guys know it, maybe you don't pay attention to what's happening in the world. I know some know, but, but listen, do you not know that people inside of the prisons are suing the states because their accommodations are not up to par? Listen to me carefully. If you don't want a bad accommodations, 
stop doing things in society like robbing people and doing things like that that you would be sent to prison now if anybody innocent is sent to prison it does something in their lives then only they can receive the lord is still for them and if they belong to the most high then my goodness that's some power and authority granted to that individual that nobody else will ever have because they would have to go through that situation that's what happens when you believe you start to see the truth I've talked to a person who was locked up for, I believe, over 60 years. The person realized three months after they were released, because they were, they were just grateful they were released at first, but then they found out what the Lord was doing. And then they said, oh, my goodness, in order for somebody to see like I'm seeing, they would have to be innocent and be locked up for all those years. But then the person admitted and said, if I were not locked up, I would have been a product of my own neighborhood and my own family. I would likely not be alive. That's what they said. You talk about a real discouragement that will break a generational curse? Lord have mercy. To break a generational curse? Are you kidding? When something happens to an individual that they did not evoke, it will break generational curses. It puts that person on a plane of existence that you can only be on if you go through that same exact thing. And when the Lord works with a person like that, they're going to be different than everybody else. They're going to be very different. So listen to me carefully. The Lord knows exactly what he's doing. But why won't his own children trust that the Lord knows what he's doing? We can change that. We can absolutely analyze our lives and change that. And I hope that we do a quick work of that. I really do. Because the Lord is not raising us to be murmurers and complainers. He's not raising us to give excuses to the flesh. He's raising us to be family. And the last I read at the throne of God is perfection. You know what the definition of perfection is? God's perfection is to be what you're intended to be. A perfect banana. Do you guys know what that looks like? It can be rotten. It can have worms in it. But so long as it's a banana, it is a perfected banana. Do you hear me? Because it is what it was intended to be. It might be bruised up, but it's perfect. Do you hear me? It's what God intends something to be. Now, if you pick up a banana and you open it up and an orange is on the inside, that's an imperfect fruit. It is not what God intended it to be. Did you hear what I just said? God's perfection is something being what he intended it to be. Can't you see what man is doing? They're hybridizing everything. Everything God intended to be as that one thing. They are doing what? They're changing it. And I'll tell you guys again by 2040, by their own words and in their own doctrine and in their own laws that they do follow, by 2040, nothing must be natural. You know what that means? Nothing will be as God intended it to be. It will be as they created it to be. You do know they're going to accomplish this by 2025. You do know that, right? For anybody who says, yes, they're also changing human beings. They can't change you against your will. That won't work. You have to agree with it, or Satan cannot impose it upon you. I hope you know that. That's why they're, they do wonky things. They need you to agree. And do you know what happens when you ignore something? When you go along with it because somehow it benefits you? That's your stamp of approval. And then whatever, which, whatever craft they're doing will prosper in your life. You know in the Bible it says no weapon formed against you shall prosper. What happens if you agree with a weapon being used against you? Then it's going to prosper. You know in the Bible when it says he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand? Do you know what craft is? Craft is the imposing of a will upon somebody. Now, the, when you impose a will upon somebody and by their acceptance, that will actually works. That's witchcraft. That's what that is. Kind of like marketing. When the world gives you a proposal of something and they tell you something is good and they say, hey, we'll give you $1,000 if you say it's good. And if you go along with their plans and you're not refuting it, you're not praying against it, then you're complicit with it. You're in agreement with it. See, in the realm of reality, to give your stamp of approval is to not protest. So when you don't protest against something, then you are with it. Remember, Jesus said this. He said, they, they would say, hey, Jesus, these people are not your disciples, and they're preaching in your name. And what did Jesus say? Because they were concerned about that. They said, these guys are over here doing things in your name. We don't even know who they are. And Jesus said, a truth of all truths, if they're not against us, they're for us. Right? Now, that's an actual principle. Do you hear me? So if you're not protesting against something, then you're for it. And that's how curses in the world work. That's why you don't sit there and stay silent like a good little pup. 
You don't do that. You're given the power of prayer, but you have to become activated. you got to get active. You may have it in your mind that you as one person can't make a difference. You can't make that change. Nothing is stopping you from praying. And do you know what? Prayer is a part of the sincereness of you. So when you don't pray against, when you, when, when, when you don't pray against some of the evils that you see, you're complicit with it. If you're not against it, you're for it. Did that help some of you out? If Jesus said it, then it is true. And it's operating everywhere, whether you accept it or not. If you're not against it, you are for it. You remember when in the Bible it said, my people suffer for a lack of knowledge? When you don't know a thing, you'll never protest it. You'll never have an issue with it. And guess what? Don't tell me what you don't know won't hurt you. I'll tell you right now, what you don't know can kill you, can wear you out. In fact, that's what's worn you out, is what you didn't know. But God gives you an opportunity to know. Only in our slothfulness do we walk around in ignorance. Because the Lord said he gives wisdom. He gives wisdom to those who ask him. He'll give you knowledge. He'll give you understanding. He'll give you wisdom liberally to those who ask him. The problem is our communication with the Messiah is a little limited. Because we've been trained that only in a time of trouble do we go to him in prayer and ask for the solution we thought. Who taught us that? Who taught us that when we're in trouble, that we should pray for the solution we think will work? I hear people do that all the time. They'll say, Mike, can you pray that the Lord helps the doctor in this surgery to fix so-and-so? And, -so and, well, and then my first thought is in truth. How in the world does a person know what's actually going to fix the issue? A person could have a surgery, but that may not even be the problem. I don't pray like that. I trust the Lord. I trust his method and his way. I do not trust my own solutions. If something happened to me, I'm not going to say, Lord, fix this specific thing that's pious and prideful. I will never, ever do that. I trust whatever the Lord comes up with. He already knows what's going to fix the whole problem. And that's exactly how I pray. I don't become the expert of my own issue and pray that the Lord manifest my solution. I never do that. But that's how people have been taught to pray haven't they? They have been taught to pray that the Lord manifest their solution. Think about it, because something has usurped the populist church, teaching all sorts of weird ways. Who in the world would teach a person to pray that the Lord manifest their own personal solution in a problem? But isn't that exactly what, the, what people in the world have taught you to do? That's exactly what they have done. I'm always praying, Lord, thy will be done. There it is. Everything is solved. Just that simple. And, and immediately your mind says, well, is that enough? Of course it is, because the will of God is good. If somebody were to ever pray in my behalf and say the Lord's will be done, that is the best prayer anybody could ever pray. Do you know why? Because the will of God is good. That's why. The will of God is good. Somebody says, Mike, how do we break from that? All you have to do is see it. You have to see the truth of it. Don't sweep it under a rug. Pull it out from underneath the rug and look at the thing. Start looking at everything. Look at all of it. And you're going to find that a great percentage of what you've learned through the grapevine has been destructive. More destructive than good in your life. That's what happens when you take somebody else's word for something. you got to start looking at things for yourselves. you got to put your eyes on it and say, okay, Lord, what is this? It's got to be you and the Lord. Not you, the Lord, Mike, from around the world, but you and the Lord. You've got to take it out and look at it and examine it and see what the Lord wants you to do about that thing. Don't depend upon me or anybody else. You've got to have your own relationship with the Most High. Pull that thing out from under the rug, right? See, with this situation with prayer, a lot of people say, oh, I know how to pray. Well, that's sweeping it back under the rug. Take it out. Pull it out. Pull everything out. Start looking at everything. You better make sure that what you have is what you really have. How many are mechanics? And you thought you had a wrench. And when you pulled the wrench out, that wrench was broken. It didn't work. You ever do that? You ever been in your kitchen and you pull out some pan or pot or something, the handle's broke, and you say, oh, I thought it was, I forgot it was broken. That's right, because you didn't pull it out, examine it, look at it, and have it fixed. You tucked it right back in the drawer again. Everybody has a junk drawer. You don't know what the state is of the stuff in that junk drawer. Pull all that stuff out and look at it. If it's broken, get rid of it. Don't keep something broken. 
with, with a mindset, well, maybe I could use it for something. Well, true enough. But one day will come when you need that specific item and you're going to need it working. And you're going to deceive yourself because now you have a broken item that you have forgotten is broken. The day will come when you will need it and you'll be frustrated. Why? Because you tucked it back in the drawer again. With your relationship with Christ, pull it out. And the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That means a deep and intimate inspection of your relationship with Christ. Never assume anything. Start looking at it. Now listen, I have to warn you, because in this day and age, we have fanciful mindsets. Do you know what that means? A fanciful mindset is when you can't help but to throw a little imagination in the truth. If you throw your imagination in the truth, it is not the truth. Learn to accept the simplicity of what the Lord has given you. Somebody asked me the other day, how do you rebuke a demon? And my answer was, you stand against it. They said, well, aren't you supposed to say something? I said, well, it doesn't matter. You just stand against it. They said, you mean to tell me you can rebuke a demon by not saying something? Because they thought rebuking a demon was saying that you rebuke a demon. No, to rebuke a demon, a proper rebuke is when you stand against something. You can say all you want, but if you're doing the same activities a demon is, you can't say I rebuke it and that be truth. You're going to speak a word of hypocrisy. You're in your home. You're on the phone with somebody. You don't like what they said. Your emotions get riled up. You get angry at the person and hang up. Then your child walks in the door. They get angry at their brother or sister. You're the one that opened the door. Whatever works in you can work to your household. So you stand in a rebuke. To rebuke something like that is to refuse to operate by its power. So the next time somebody's on the phone and they're doing the same thing, do not get out of placement, out of your position with Christ. Stand in Christ and in love. Don't sit there and be compromised believing what you just heard. Understand what the situation is. Oh, this person doesn't know it, but they're in agent mode, knocking me off balance. No, I stand against aggravation. I stand against all darkness. And you hang the phone up and eat crow, do whatever you have to do. And when your child walks in the door and they're highly frustrated, all of a sudden they're frustrated coming in the door. But because you wouldn't allow the frustration to take place into your house, they come into the door and all of a sudden they sit down and they cry. And they say, I feel better. Well, what happened? Well, I was frustrated, but I'm better now. Wouldn't you like that situation? But if you give in to it, if you react from it, and when I say react, it, you don't have to show it you start feeling it, then you're operating by that power. You've let it do its work. You've let it in your house. Then your child walks in. They're already aggravated. Then they throw a conniption fit. Why? Because you open the door. When you rebuke something, you refuse to operate by it. So you don't fall for traps. It doesn't matter who it is, your mother, your dad, your, your grandmother, whoever, whoever it is. Satan or dark forces will work through anybody. When they're in a moment of compromise, they can get to you. If you respond, you just open the door for operation of that power in your house. Start shutting the doors. When somebody does something off kilter that really gets to you, you got to analyze, why is it getting to me? And shut that door yourself so that the next time it does not work. Dark entities will continue to use the same things over and over again so long as they work no matter what you do. If it works against you, it is prosperous against you. And I'm telling you right now, many of you have prayed and it still came back to you, didn't it? And you never understood why. I'll tell you why. Because when you act on it, you've just voided your own prayer. To take an active stance against any of this darkness, you must stop responding to it. In other words, stop believing it. You only respond to those things you actually believe. Do you see that? If you believe it, you're going to respond to it. So stop believing in darkness. Stop believing in negativity. Stop believing in failure and all these other concepts that people have taught you. Stop believing in it. Believe in the Messiah. Stop believing in all this other stuff. Your emotional state will change based on what you actually believe in. People get in a fearful state because they believe in what fear is communicating. Stop believing in everything. Listen, the more truth you take in, the less you're going to take in this other stuff. Start taking in truth. I'm sure that a lot of people, how do I not react to this? Stop believing in it. If a person comes into your home violent, instantly you're going to believe that somehow they're going to do this. You start believing in things. Stop believing in it. How do you do that? You need to fill yourself up with the Messiah. 
That means you're going to have to become a student of the New Testament. Remember what the Lord said. If a spirit leaves, or if it's ejected out of a person, it's going to go out and find nothing but dry places. It's going to come back to see its house where it came from swept clean. Once he finds it swept clean, he's going to go out and find seven worse than it was, and it's going to come back, and the person's in condition is going to be worse than the first. When you kick out the belief of this nonsense of darkness, when you stop believing in that, you're going to have to fill yourself with a belief of something. That's why you become a student of the New Testament, specifically of Christ Jesus. In other words, don't read the Bible and argue with the Lord. Read the Bible and believe the Lord. You believe everything negative. It's time to believe in the Messiah. People get worried. People get in high states of fear. People get all these deprived, aggravated, irritated because they believe in what's being presented to them. Stop believing in that stuff and believe in the Messiah. That's when your life actually changes. Okay, now we got to the core of the problem. You see that? How many can see that? We're at the root of the issue. Now the ball's in your court. You take the next step. Now you see the whole thing. It's not that I'm the only one who knows this, but the day we live in right now, the Lord will speak a thing through one It'll be confirmed a thousand different places all day. It'll start dovetailing now. It's going to be out there. So snap to it. It's needed. Why would the Lord bring something like this forward if it were useless? Hopefully you see it now. You can do something with it. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved? If you're not willing to repent. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.